Hello everyone and welcome to the 25th video in the TypeScript game engine tutorial series. Today we're going to be adding bitmap fonts and what a bitmap font basically is is it allows us to render text to our screen and it allows us to do that by using an image and some positional data um, and taking those two things and creating some sprites on the screen and then drawing the text. So to illustrate kind of what I mean by this, uh, I've got some assets that I need to copy in uh, and these will be available on uh, on GitHub. But the first thing I need to do is go into my assets folder and create a new one and we're going to call this fonts. And I'm just going to grab this text font and text PNG. These are the files that I'm going to be using. And if we take a closer look at these, <clears throat> this first one is um, an image here. So this has got a bunch of commonly used characters that we will need uh, when trying to render text to a screen. So you'll notice that there are uppercase and lowercase letters and numbers on there and there are also a few symbols, some brackets, parentheses, period, var various punctuation. And all of these things are are commonly used characters that we're going to need. Now it doesn't contain obviously some of the extended characters that maybe some of your uh, your system fonts include and whatnot, but for the purposes of this tutorial series and most games to be completely honest, you just need a basic set up like this. And so what we do is we use this image in combination with a FNT file um, which contains a bunch of positional data. So if we actually look in this file uh, we can sort of pick apart how this file is formatted and figure out um, what all of the, the data is. So if I look up uh, ASCII uh, character codes on Google. Uh, let's see, let's go ahead and use this one. ASCIItable.com has been a site that I've used for years for this. We have a listing here of all these individual characters and the associated codes that go with them. Now, the ones that we're interested in is everything in this decimal column. So um, your typical ASCII set has 128 characters. All of the characters in here are within that 128 characters. And so if we look at uh, each one of these things, a space, for example, is, is 32. That's the sort of code that the computer uses uh, internally to uh, represent a space. Uh, you can look at, uh, I think it was 65 for A, a capital letter A. Um, so you have all these individual character codes, these ASCII character codes. And so if we look back at our font file, we can see here that we have character ID 32, ID equals 36, ID equals 92. These are the ASCII character codes. So this is basically saying this is the character that we want to use. And then from there it has uh, some X and Y coordinates, which is the pixel coordinates within this image that describes where that particular character is. And so if we take a look at, uh, let me see if I can find, sixty-five. So if we look at this, um, this is basically saying the capital A is at 190 pixels from the left and 301 pixels at, from the top. And if we look in here, it's right here. And that's about what that is, if you look at it. I could open this up in an image editor, but I think you kind of get the point. Uh, the next thing that we have is we have the height of the character. And uh, we have an X offset, which is basically a amount to offset on the X axis and a, an amount to offset on the Y axis. Some of the characters have these. Um, because they are different heights than other characters. 
and require um, that they be pushed down further than other characters. And here we can see that we just have everything as a grid, but the characters, when you, when you actually write them out, don't necessarily uh, all line up that way. So these offsets help us determine where to render those things. And then the X advance is basically the number of pixels that this character should advance the string of characters. So if we take a look at uh, Notepad++ here, we can see that each individual character occupies a certain amount of space. And since this is a fixed width font, that's going to be the same number of pixels. It looks like it's about, I don't know, eight pixels or so. But for a lot of fonts, like this one up here, that number can vary. And so that varying number is what this X advance represents. And then next we have uh, channel and page. We aren't really going to be using these things, but just to sort of go over them really quickly. Uh, if we look at the top of the file, we have a page line here, and ID equals zero, file ex equals text PNG. And so basically what that's saying is for this page of characters, uh, use text.png as the image uh, lookup for that. So this format actually supports um, multiple textures being used. So if you've got a really detailed font, you could technically use more than one. Our system isn't going to support that. Um, it could always be extended to, but to keep things simple, I'm not going to support that. We've got some other properties in here, like line height, um, your scale, which is uh, scale width and scale height, which is actually the size of the image. Um, and then, the, you know, the number of pages, uh, whether it's packed or not, which we actually don't really care about, um, the, the size of the font, um, all these different things that we're going to be able to use to figure out how to actually draw this to the screen. And so when we get ready to actually draw it to the screen, the way that it's going to work, and I'm, act I'm actually just going to make a quick example here in, um, in Paint. So if we type some text, right, let's, uh, let's go with a fixed width font here. Go to the Lucida console. Let's crank up the font size so we can see what we're talking about here. Okay, so um, if we were to write this out, we would uh, let's use, for example, actually, you know what? Let's not use the fixed width font. Um, let's go ahead and use Arial, for example. This is a pretty commonly used font. So if we were to write out uh, the word duck, for example, um, each one of these characters has different properties, right? They have a different height, they have a different width, um, and they have different offsets. And so this is ultimately what we're going to wind up rendering to the screen. And if we were to take this and figure out how we would actually break this down to render it to the screen, what we're going to wind up with is a bunch of sprites that sort of look a little bit like this. So, um, just draw these out here. Oops. Sorry about the terrible art, but I think this kind of illustrates the point. So it's not perfect, but anyways, you guys, I think, kind of get the idea. So you can see that the size of all of these, um, all of these individual sprites that we're going to render uh, varies. And so basically we're going to use texture coordinates to blit the the image onto these sprites after we figure out how big they should be and that's how we're going to render our text to the screen. So when you break it down it's actually really not that complicated. Um, it's It honestly takes a little bit longer just to sort of parse the contents of this file and, and get the, all of that working correctly than anything else. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into it. Okay, so, as I said before, uh, the first thing that I did was I actually uh, created a fonts folder, added our um, FNT file and our PNG file, and one thing before I forget, um, in case you're wondering how to actually make this file, uh, there is a program called BM font. 
and I can put a link in it in, in the description, but basically it's at uh, angelcode.com slash products BM font. It's a free uh, bitmap font generator. So this uh, will actually allow you to input a bunch of things and generate these uh, these files for you. Okay. The first thing that we're going to want to do is we're actually going to want to create a loader for this. And for this one we can actually just use a generic text file loader. So that's what I'm going to go ahead and create. So I'm going to add, add a new TypeScript file and we're going to call this text asset loader. Okay, namespace TSE and we're going to export um, a couple of classes. Uh, the first thing we'll go ahead and export text asset, right? So we need to set up an asset type for this. And uh, it's going to implement iAsset. Okay, so this is going to work very similar to our other uh, asset types. It's going to have a public read only name, which is of type string. It's going to have a public read only data which is also of type string and a constructor so a public constructor and it's going to take in name of type string and data of type string okay and then of course we're just going to set this dot name equals name this dot data equals data. That's all there is to the text asset. So the loader itself is also fairly straightforward. Uh, it looks a lot like our other loaders. So um, what we're going to do is just say export class text asset loader and it's going to implement i asset loader. There it is. Okay. And it's going to have a public getter called supported extensions. Right? It's going to return a string array. Oops. There we go. And it's simply going to return text. That's it. Um, that's the only type of uh, file that this text loader's uh, this asset loader is going to support. And that should be text asset loader, not test. Okay. Next we're gonna have public load asset and it's gonna take in an asset name type string and it's going to return type void. And while we're at it, I'm going to go ahead and create a private on text loaded. And this is going to take in, again, the asset name, just type string. It's going to take in the request, the quest object, which is going to be the uh, of type XML HTTP request. And it's going to also have a return type of void. We'll fill that out in a minute. So, in load asset, we're going to create a request, and we're going to say new uh, XML HTTP request, and next we're going to say request dot open, and it's going to be of type get because we're just pulling a file, and we're going to pass asset name. Okay. And then we're going to add an event listener. So request add event listener. And it's going to be of type load. And then it's going to be this dot on text loaded dot bind this. Um, and it's going to take uh, also asset name and the request object. And then we're going to say request dot send. Okay. On loaded, uh, 
let's go ahead and create a debug message for this. So we'll say console.debug and say on text loaded and then asset name uh, request just so that we can see some of these things if we need to debug it. Asset name request got a comma up here. There we go. All right. And we'll say if request.ready state equals request.done. Uh, we'll uh, go ahead and create the asset. So we'll say let asset equal new text asset. And that's going to take asset name. And the data is going to actually be the request dot response text. Okay. And then we're going to say, we're going to call asset manager. Uh, and we're going to call asset manager dot on asset loaded. And we're going to pass asset. And that should be everything that we need to do as far as actually loading the asset. Um, let me think. No, there is one more thing we need to do. Um, so in the asset manager, we need to register the loader. So we'll say asset manager loaders push, and we'll create a new uh, text asset loader. Okay, so the next thing that we're going to actually create is the graphics object for it. So um, under graphics, we're going to add a new TypeScript file, and this is going to simply be called bitmap font namespace TSE. Okay. And the first thing we're going to do is create a class called font utilities. And notice that I'm not exporting this class because this class is actually only going to be used within this file. So I don't need to export it. And this is for now just going to have one method. It's going to be a public static method called extract field value. And that is going to take in field of type string and return type string. And we're going to return uh, field dot split and it's going to split on the equal sign and then it's going to return the second component of that. Okay, and what that's basically going to do is allow us in this file to say, give me the field called ID, right? So it'll take this part of the, the line and split it by this. And we're saying, give us a second one. So basically, if we say, give us ID, we're going to get 35. If we say, give us X, we're going to get 423. Okay. Next, we need to export another class, and this is going to be called font glyph. And what a font glyph is, is this is actually what is going to hold all of this, uh, each, each one of these pieces of, of font data. So it's going to hold all these individual properties right here. And so we need a public ID, which is a type number. Uh, we need a public x, which is a type number, a public y, which is a type number. We need a width, which is a type number. Uh, that's public. These are all going to be public. Public height, which is a type number. We're going to need 
let's see, I think it was x offset and y offset. So let's say x offset, public x offset number, public y offset number. Um, let me just fix the capitalization on this just to make it a little easier to read. We're also going to need a public x advance, which is a type number. We're going to go ahead. We're going to go ahead and store the uh, page property and the channel property, even though we're not going to use them. Uh, this way, if we decide to extend this later, we don't have to come back into this code and add that functionality. Uh, we can simply just uh, support it in um, in the actual bitmap font itself. Okay. So uh, the next thing we need to do is create a public static method, and we're going to call this from a ah, from fields, and this is going to take fields, which is a string array, and it's going to return a font glyph. So this is going to be a nice, easy way for us to. Wow, I messed that up, didn't I? It's going to be a nice, easy way for us to retrieve these font glyphs um, and, and automatically get um, all of this data simply extracted basically from uh, a line. And I'll show you in a minute how that's going to work. So the first thing we need to do is we need to create um, a glyph. And that's of type font glyph equals new font glyph. Right? And we don't have a constructor here. So it's just a default constructor that we're going to be using. And next, we're going to fill that out. So um, at the end here, we'll first say return glyph. And now we can actually populate the field. So we can say, well, actually, what I'm going to do just for the sake of expediency here is I'm just going to copy all the field names. And I'm going to use my column select to replace the publics with glyph dot. Uh, and then I'm just going to get rid of the text to the end of the line for all of these. Okay. And let's just go ahead and put equals on all these things too. Right. Okay. So what we're going to need to do is say font utilities dot extract field value and we're just going to simply pass it fields and in this case we want the first field right so the way that I've structured this is the order of the fields here matches the order of the fields in the file from left to right right so when we're extracting our glyph um, ID is technically going to be the, the the second element in this. So what we're going to wind up doing is um, we're basically going to take this this entire line and split it by white space. Um, and so this character basically tells us what type the line is. So that's technically the first field. ID is the second field. Um, and then you have X, Y, width, height, X offset, Y offset, etc. So uh, we can do these things um, nice and quickly in order here. So um, the only thing that we'll need to do with that is cast it to a number. Um, and that's safe because we know that all of these uh, values of these fields are numbers. So uh, there's no issue there. Okay, and I'm actually just going to copy this all the way down. And then all I'll have to do is change the numbers. So I can change this one to 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, whoops, and 10. And that's it. That's all we have to do to get our font glyphs. All right, so now we can finally create the bitmap font class. So we're going to export that. And it's going to implement 
the iMessage handler interface. Uh, so let's go ahead and implement that. Okay. So this one's going to have a few private properties. Uh, the first one's going to be the name, which is just going to be of type string. We're going to also have uh, a font file name, which is going to be a string. We're going to have a um, a flag to say whether the asset is loaded, and that's going to be of type boolean and default to false. Uh, the next thing we're going to have is the image file, uh, or the name of that, so we're just going to be private underscore image, image file type string. Uh, we're going to also have a map of glyphs, so uh, that's simply created this way, uh, where the type is of type object with a, uh, let's see, we'll say with an ID of type number and a value of font glyph. All right, and we're going to initialize that to an empty object. All right, so we'll have a, a nice map of all the glyphs that are available, and we can look those up by ID. The next thing we need is size, which is a number. That's going to be the font size. And we're going to need a another one for the image width, which is obviously going to be a number. And one more for the image height, which is also going to be a number. OK, uh, that's all the fields that we should need for right now. So the first thing I'm going to do is actually create uh, just a few accessors to some of these things because some of them are going to need to be accessed outside of this. So create a public get and do one for the name, turn type string, return this dot name. Right. And the next one is going to be a public get size. Wow, messed that up. Okay. Size. Turn this dot size. Make sure you return the underscore here or uh, you'll get an infinite loop of it trying to, to sort of get itself. I'm actually just going to copy this because the next few properties are uh, numbers. So I'm going to paste two copies of these. So we need image width and image height. Right, so just copy that, get rid of the underscore, copy that, get rid of the underscore. Okay, and one last thing, let's go ahead and also create a getter for the texture name. So I'm just going to copy this guy here, and we'll rename this to texture name, and return image file. Let's yeah, you know what? Let's go ahead and also say public uh, get um, is loaded. It's going to be a type boolean. And as you may have guessed, we're going to return this dot uh, asset loaded. It should be asset loaded, not asset load. Fix that. Okay. And now all we have to do is fill in um, a few methods. So the first one is going to be uh, it's going to be a public load method, and it's going to return type void. The next method is going to be a public on message. Actually, we've already got that up here. Let me just grab this and move it down. Okay, we'll implement that in a minute. Uh, we also need a public get glyph. Wow, I messed up the spelling of that too. Okay. Okay. And here we're going to pass in a character of type string 
and return a font glyph. All right, and I think the last public one we're going to need is going to be a measure text. So measure text, it's actually going to take in text of type string, and it's going to return a number. OK, now that we've got those filled out, um, or at least stubbed out, let's go ahead and fill them out, rather. So on load, the first thing we need to do is get the asset. So we'll say let asset equals asset manager uh, dot load asset. Whoops, I'm sorry. Get asset. And we're just going to pass it this font file name. Okay? And we'll say if asset is not equal to undefined. Then we'll say, uh, you know what, we need, we need one private method actually to call here. So uh, it's going to be called private process file. Um, let's call it process font file. Let's be a little bit more specific. And it's going to take in say data, type string, turn type void. Okay, and so if the asset is not defined, we're going to say this dot process font file, and we're going to say asset dot data. Otherwise, we're going to subscribe to a message and it's going to be message loader, message asset loader, asset loaded, plus this dot font file name, and its handler is going to be this. Okay, so basically, if we if we don't already have the asset loaded, we're just going to listen for it to be loaded, and that's pretty much all load does. So as you may have guessed, we need to now handle the receipt of this message in on message. So we're going to simply say if message dot code equals the same thing that we subscribe to, then we can go ahead and say this dot process font file and we'll go ahead and cast the message dot context as a text asset and get the data from that and pass that through right so either way process font file is going to be called and the content of that font file will be passed to it we'll fill that out in a minute Let's go ahead and just finish off the couple of public methods, and then we'll go ahead and, and process the font file. So for get glyph, uh, there's going to be, basically we're going to look up the code that's passed through um, in our dictionary here of glyphs. But we also need to handle the case of what happens if a user passes through something that isn't in that table. Um, a character code that doesn't exist there. What do we do? And in our case, we're actually just going to replace it with a question mark. So we're just going to put a comment here, place um, unrecognized characters with a question mark. And so we're going to say, we're going to go ahead and get the code, which is going to be the character. And this is going to be, this is of type string, but technically uh, we're only going to be passing one character. So it might be A in here, for example, or B, or something like that, or an excla ex exclamation point. And so we can say uh, character, uh, character code at space zero or index zero and so that'll basically give us the character code 
for the first character of this string, which really is the only character we're, we're interested in anyways. And that, of course, returns type number. So uh, this will give us that ASCII character code that we need. And then from there, um, we'll say, this is where we'll do our replacement if it's invalid. So we'll say um, code equals this dot glyphs um, code equals undefined. So in other words, if it's undefined, we're going to use a ternary statement here. And we're going to return 63. Otherwise, we're going to leave it set to code. So in case you haven't seen one of these statements before, uh, you basically have your condition here, and then a question mark. And you're, say, you're going to say, if this condition is true. Um, so in other words, if this code is not defined, then we're going to go ahead and return 63 otherwise return code and then we're going to set that to code. So if we look back at our ASCII table and we look at 63 sure enough that is our question mark. So I just happen to know some of these things off the top of my head just because I've been using them for so many years. Um, anyway uh, next thing we're going to do is go ahead and return I'm just going to copy it straight from here this glyphs code that's all there is to it. So if it can't find it, it's just going to return a question mark. Otherwise, it's actually going to give you the glyph for the proper um, for that character that you passed in. So measure text is going to get a little bit tricky. Um, so the way that measure text works is, or at least in this case, what it's going to actually provide is, oh, you know what? I put number here. This should be vector two. It's going to return a size, right? So it's going to say what are the extents of this, right? So it's basically going to look like this. It's going to return what this total value is, right? So it's going to add up all these characters this way, figure out what the height, the max height of um, a character in that is, and then it's going to return that value. Now, if we were to have a new line character halfway through here, and we wind up with something like this, right? So you want a multi-line string. It will actually handle that and you return you this amount. And so that's what we need to go ahead and set up here in measure text. So first off, let's create a size. And that's going to be of type vector2, obviously. And it's going to be vector2.0. Okay? And we're going to go ahead and return that size at the bottom. All right, so the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to create a couple of uh, local variables, x and y. And they're both going to start at 0. So let x equal 0, let y equal 0. And these are basically going to be keeping track of what our x and y position is. So as we iterate through the characters, we're going to say, OK, now x is here, now x is here. Oh, we've reset. Now x is back here, but y is here. right? So it, it's a way for us to sort of track as we, as we loop through the characters. So as you may have guessed, um, we're going to loop through each character in the text string that's provided. What we're going to do is we're actually going to create a switch on C. And we're going to say case new line. right? So if, we're, if we encounter a new line in our string, and this is the escape sequence for that. Um, escape sequences in JavaScript uh, are preceded by a backslash and then a character. Um, there's a lot of these. Uh, Windows typically tends to do backslash r backslash n for carriage return line feed. Um, we're only going to support line feed. And basically that's when when you hit enter on the keyboard and you force something to a new line, that's a new line. So uh, saying backslash n is our way of saying when we run into a new line character, do this. So we're going to reset x to 0. And then y is going to be incremented by this dot size. OK. 
Okay. And then we're going to say the default case is going to be x plus equals this dot get glyph c dot x advance. And y won't be incremented at all in this case, so we'll break. And this actually needs to break too. I don't want to fall through there. And that should be all there is to that. Um, I don't see this as being something that we'll use a lot right out of the gate, but uh, it is definitely something that will come in handy in the future, so uh, I want to go ahead and add it in there just for good measure. Uh, one last thing that we need to do is size.set xy before we return size. So that the actual um, <laughs> value returned here isn't just zero. That's actually not 100% what we need to do. We need to actually keep track of max x. So let's go ahead and create one more called max x. And before we reset x to zero, we'll go ahead and advance it to. Hmm. No. We don't need to do that. Um, what we'll say is if x is greater than max x, then we'll go ahead and set max x equal to the value of x. And instead of using just x here, we'll use max x. There we go. Because we always want to keep track of uh, the maximum value, the furthest that we've gone over on the x-axis. Um, when we're, we're generating our size. So this should be uh, pretty solid. Now for the long part of processing this file. So the way we're going to process this file is line by line. Uh, each line has a type, which is basically the first field of that line. So we have an info, common, page, characters, which gives us a count, and then uh, the individual uh, character definition for each one of those characters. So the way we're going to process this is we're going to create a couple of uh, temporary variables. So we'll say let care count and number equals zero. And we're also going to say let lines, which is a string array, equals, uh, we're going to say data dot split and we're going to split that by new line. Okay, so basically this is how we're going to get line by line, and then we're going to loop through that. So for let line of lines, right? And everything's going to be done within this loop, basically. So the first thing that we need to do is sanitize the line. And what that means is basically we need to we need to sort of clean the data up a little bit. Um, and speaking of which, I actually want to rename something here. Let's call this content instead, because this is the file content, right? Because I actually want to use data down here. So we'll say let data equals line dot replace. And we're going to use something called a regular expression here, just because it makes it really, um, really straightforward in terms of how much code needs to be written to do this. But what we want to do is we want to take all forms of white space in this file and replace it with a single space. So if I show all the characters here in Notepad++, we can see that each one of these fields has a variable amount of um, characters in between it. Some of them only have two spaces, some of them only have one, there might be tabs, other weird characters in there. So just to cover sort of all the bases, I want to say globally any character that is any kind of white space just replace it with one space. And I'm not really going to go into regular expressions a lot here because uh, that is a whole topic on its own. But the way that you create a regular expression in this case is we're going to say forward slash backslash s backslash s plus and then forward slash g 
So that's bas basically saying, give me any of the white space globally for this line. And we're going to replace that with a single space. And again, uh, regular expressions are something that you can look up. Um, they're, they can get pretty complicated, um, but they're, uh, they're, they tend to be really fast in how they operate. And we don't have to like loop through each individual character and look for multiple white space characters and replace them all. This will basically take all of these things and um, it'll replace all these groups of spaces or tabs or whatever these are with a single space. And that'll make things very easy when we go to do the next step, which is to get our fields, which is basically going to be data data.split, as you may have guessed, on the space. So um, this is actually, as you may have guessed, what we are going to feed into our get fields, uh, extract field value rather. And so when we when we actually look at our our glyph, um, all these these fields that get passed in, this is what's going to be passed in. Okay. So the next thing we need to do is look at the type of line. So to do that, we're going to use a switch statement. And it's going to be, it's actually going to switch off the first field. So fields, zero. So if you recall, the first field is actually going to be this guy here. So info, common, page, characters, or char. OK. And so the first case is going to be info. And in that case, uh, we just want to simply say this dot size. Oops. Um, we're going to cast this to a number, and we're going to say font utilities um, extract field value, and we want to say fields. I believe it's two. So if we look at the info line. Yeah, size is 72. So size is what we want to grab here. OK, and then that's it. That's all we need from the info line for right now. Next is the common line. So this, we're going to actually extract two properties. It's going to be uh, this.image width. And I'm actually just going to copy this section of code right here, because it's basically the same. So it's going to be field three. And I'm going to copy this whole line and do the same for height. And that is going to be fields four. Right. Uh, let's see, what did I? Missing a bracket there. OK. OK. Next is the page type. Yeah, let's go ahead. And... Now, this one is going to involve quite a lot of code, so I'm actually going to wrap this um, in some curly braces, uh, just so that uh, this is a little bit easier scoped. Uh, this is something you can do in JavaScript. I know I haven't done it a lot. Um, but JavaScript and TypeScript and a lot of other languages actually allow you to scope variables just doing this. Um, and so I don't want this stuff to be available to any of the other cases. So um, I'm going to go ahead and scope it like that. So we'll say let ID um, type number. And we're actually going to paste the same thing again. Just going to be the value extracted from field, I think it's in this case, one. Right, yeah, one, OK. OK. Let's go ahead and recopy that. OK, and let's go ahead and get the image file. We'll extract that, 
that's actually not a number this time, uh, from fields 2. Okay. And the next thing we're actually going to have to do is, if you notice, this particular field actually has quotes, so we need to strip those. And I could just find and replace each one, but again, I think I'm going to use um, a regular expression here. And this one's going to be the simpler than the last. So we're going to say this dot image file dot replace, and we're just going to say slash double quote slash g and we're just going to replace it with nothing okay so let's put a comment in here strip quotes okay and then let's go ahead and prepend um, the path to the image name um, and I'm going to mark a to-do in here. This should probably um, be configurable uh, as to what that path is. But for now, it's just going to be hard-coded. Uh, so we'll say this dot image file equals assets forward slash fonts, um, and then plus this dot image file. And you know what, let's go ahead and wrap these in parentheses and call trim on it. Just to make sure that we don't have any spaces or any weirdness in there. Okay, uh, that actually should be it as far as that case goes. Okay, now the next one is going to be cares. So that's going to be this line here and all we all that's there is the count, but we're going to go ahead and grab that so that we have a sanity check. So um, this is where our character count is going to be gotten from. So we're just going to extract that and cast it to a number. Um, and then I'm also going to I'm going to increment the expected count um, because the the file name here um, or the file rather this says a 94 count and it's actually off by one for some reason um, because the amount of characters that you wind up with is actually 95 characters. Um, I'm not really sure why that is, but um, the file's uh, count is off by one. So we'll say character count plus plus. All right, final case is character. Right, and this is the, the one that uh, is really going to give um, give us all the uh, the information that we need our our glyphs. So um, we're going to say let glyph equals font glyph dot from fields, and we're going to pass fields, and then we're simply going to add an a uh, an entry in our dictionary. So we're going to say this glyphs glyph.id equals glyph. Okay. Um, and as I mentioned before, we're keeping this character count, so let's go ahead and do some validation. So once we actually reach the end of this for loop, uh, we need to verify that the loaded glyphs um, that we have the right number of them. So say let actual glyph count equals zero 
and then we only want to count properties and you'll see what I mean here in a second so let's say let keys equals object dot keys and we're going to pass that this dot glyphs so before I move on um, what object dot keys does is it actually returns all the properties of an object that you pass it and so in JavaScript that means that it will return all the elements of the dictionary but it can also return um, any methods or other various properties that you have assigned to it that aren't just a straight up property um, and so we actually need to do something here to um, to manage that and make sure that it's actually a property that we're we're pulling and it's not something that's inherited from another object um, or something along those lines so we'll loop through the key and we'll say let key of keys and to check this we're gonna say uh, if this dot glyphs dot has own property and we'll pass key then we'll go ahead and say actual gift glyph count plus plus and so this is basically saying if this is actually a property that we're looking at that came from this object and isn't inherited from somewhere else um, go ahead and increment our actual glyph count and then we'll just do a quick check if actual glyph count is not equal to character count in other words the expected number then we'll simply throw a new error and we'll say um, let's use an interpolated string here we'll, instead we'll say font file reported existence of Pass character count. Yeah. Glyphs, uh, but only, and then pass actual glyph count were found. Okay. And then finally, we'll say this dot asset loaded equals true. Okay, so I know that was a lot, um, and that's that's honestly probably about uh, half the work that needs to be done. And so I think what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to keep this video short. I want to break it here um, because I know it's a little bit long-winded, and um, you guys probably want to take a break or something like that and, and come back, and we'll implement the component um, and actually get this in uh, implemented into the engine and usable. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up right here. Uh, there will be another video coming out very shortly on this. And yeah, look forward to part two of bitmap fonts. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you haven't already, consider subscribing and I will see you guys next time.